So welcome to this video where we're going to have a look at how you calculate the mass of a star. Now there are a few different ways that you can do it, but the most accurate way is to use binary star systems. So this is where you have two stars orbiting a common center of mass. And on the left hand side you can see the star system El Gol, where you've got a star orbiting around um, the more larger one in the center. So when you look at the light curve of an eclipsing binary star system, this is the, the light from the star over a period of time, you get a typical transit looking shape, a bit like a transiting exoplanet, but when they block each other's light out, it's a more V shape as opposed to a U shape because of the fact that they actually, they're stars and they're giving off their own light instead of one of them being a planet. Now the distance or the time between those transits of a single star would be your orbital period. And if both stars are of a similar size, then the transits are going to be a similar depth. If one star is big and one star is small, then you get a smaller transit and then a larger one and they alternate. So that is fairly easy to get the orbital period from these particular systems. So the actual orbital configuration of these stars would look a bit like this. So there's a common center of mass, which both stars are orbiting. The larger of the two stars is going to have the smaller orbit. It's going to be closer to the center of mass. So in this case here, we'll assume that star A is the larger of the two. And then star B is orbiting around the outside. And again, we're assuming that we are looking edge on. So it's not inclined in order, you know, compared to our observation. And the orbits are circular. In reality, that's not going to be the case. So we can get the velocity of the stars fairly easily. So we can use the Doppler effect to work out how fast they're moving by a shift in their light that we see. So if a star is moving away from us, it's going to be red shifted. If it's traveling towards us, it becomes blue shifted. And we can measure the shift in that light in order to work out how fast they're actually moving. Now we can actually do that with both stars. Because although we won't be able to visually resolve the star system most of the time, we'll just actually see one star. They're too far away to see the individual stars orbiting. But if we take the spectrum of the stars, we can identify both stars that way. And we can work out the velocities over time and their orbits. So how do we get that? Well, assuming the Doppler shift equation, what we can do is we can use a specific absorption line. So I've highlighted kind of the, the H alpha line, which is about 65, 6 nanometers. And that's normally a fairly strong line in most stars. So we might use that one. So we've got that wavelength, 6, 5, 6 nanometers. We would then look at the shift in that. You know, how much has it moved away from where it should be? And then we put it into these, this equation here, and we can actually get the velocity of the star as it orbits around its common center of mass. And when you do that, you'll get a radial velocity plot like this. So this is for star A and star B. And you can see that their velocity from our point of view obviously oscillates throughout one orbital period. When it's traveling towards us, obviously, it's going to get its largest velocity, which is the peak of this. And as it's traveling away, you will get the, the complete opposite. Now, if the orbits are circular, then you get this nice sine wave looking sort of plot. And as it does one cycle, that's one orbital period. So that's quite easy to do. So there's your orbital period, one sine wave. If it's a, an elliptical orbit, then they look a bit different. So we're not going to that in this particular video. And then the orbital velocity, again, assuming that the orbits are circular, is the peak velocity that we measure. So here is the orbital velocity for star, right? So we can measure that by looking at these radial velocity plots. And we can do the same thing for star A and for star B. So we get both of those orbital velocities and the orbital period. So going back to the orbital configuration, we can now measure VA and VB, which is the orbital velocities of both stars. We can then start to look at our RA and RB. Now this is the orbital radius of each star about the common center of mass. So that's what we need next. So we know the orbital speed, we've measured that. We also know the orbit circumference because we know the orbital speed and we know the, or, the orbital period, P. So we can then work out the circumference because we know how fast it's traveling and for how long. So we've got a circumference. And from that, we can then work out the orbital radius 
So you've got RA equals the velocity times the period divided by 2 pi, which is fairly straightforward to do. And again, it assumes that it's a circular orbit, which is the easiest one to understand. So we can do that for both stars. So we can work out the orbital radius of the star A and the orbital radius of the star B. And then the separation of the two stars is just those two added together. And this will give us our A. Now, once we've got A, we can then look at Kepler's third law. So here you're going to have the total mass of the system, which is the mass of star A plus the mass of star B, is equal to um, the separation between the two stars cubed divided by the period squared. So once we've got that, we can then actually get a mass of an individual star because we know the total mass and therefore we know the mass ratio. So the mass ratio is going to be the, equal to the ratio of the orbital radiuses and the orbital velocities as well. So once we know that, we can then work out an individual mass for one of the stars. That's the most accurate way to get a mass of a star. There are other ways. So you can use the mass luminosity relation, but it's less accurate. So here you would assume that a star with some luminosity has a mass due to some relation on the main sequence, but it's less accurate. It's, it's more you're inferring its mass from its luminosity. The most accurate way is to use the binary star system. So thank you for watching.